Ladies and gentlemen, kindly switch your mobile phones and pages to the silent mode. Thank you for your cooperation. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Hong Kong Xi'an University, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you. We hope you will find this event to be fruitful and engaging. We are delighted to be supported by the Research Grant Council of the Hong Kong government to launch a three-year institutional development scheme entitled Constructing an Interdisciplinary Research Platform at Hong Kong Xi'an University. The scheme aims to open up a gateway for promoting interdisciplinary research collaboration at the university. By welcoming more distinguished scholars from all over the world to Hong Kong, we will be able to provide valuable opportunities for local global networking, which will undoubtedly benefit the academics and professionals across different disciplines and geographic regions. This year, Xi Yan endeavors to promote one of its strategic research areas, decision making. We are very honored to have invited a well renowned expert in international economics, Professor Kai Yu Mong, to speak at our public lecture. We now invite Professor David Yuan, Head of Business Administration Department of Hong Kong Xi'an University, to deliver the welcome address. Professor Yuan, please. Uh, Professor Wong, uh, project members, distinguished guests, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this public lecture. Uh, this year, Xi'an University endeavors to promote the strategic research area of decision making in this IDS project. Uh, we are very honored to have invited a world renowned expert in international economics, Professor Kaiyo Wong, to speak at this uh, public lecture. Professor Wong is currently Professor of Economics at the University of Washington and President of the Asian Pacific Economic Association. And he is the Editor-in-Chief of China Economic Policy Review and of the Global Journal of Economics. He also serves as Editor for Asian Development Review, Journal of Economic Integration. Journal of International Trade, Journal of Asian Economy, International Journal of Economics and Business, Pacific Economic Review, and International Economics and Economic Policy. Professor Wong obtained his PhD in economics from Columbia University and has published extensively in the fields of international trade, economics, and Asian, eco Asian economist. Uh, he has offered an acclaimed textbook, International Trade in Goods and Factor Mobility, which has been widely received by researchers in international trade around the world. In addition to contributing research publications, Professor Wong has also uh, organized many conferences and workshops in international trade economics, economic growth, Asian crises, and industrial organizations to promote research interest in these areas. Uh, this evening, Professor Wong will share with us a lecture entitled Judgment in Management Risk, the One Belt, One Road Initiative, Business Opportunities and Risk Management. Uh, let's give uh, Professor Wong a warm welcome, please. Thank you, Professor Yuan. Professor Yuan, please remain on the stage. I would like to invite Professor Yuan and project member Dr. Bernard Lee to present a souvenir to our speaker, Professor Kai Yu Wong. I would, like, I would also like to invite Professor Kai Yu Wong to come on stage and receive the souvenir.
Thank you. Please be seated. It is, now, uh, it is now my pleasure to invite Professor Wong to share with us a public lecture topic, Judgment in Managing Risk, the One Belt, One Road Initiative, Business Opportunities and Risk Management. Professor Wong, please. Professor Yang, uh, the program members, uh, especially Jay, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Well, it's my pleasure to be here and I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Professor Young's invitation uh, to talk with you about uh, one of the work that I'm working on in uh, something that is very important, uh, not just to Hong Kong, uh, not just to uh, China, but also to many countries in the world. And that is the One Belt, One Road Initiative. Now, before I uh, start my talk, I would like to uh, mention that, uh, well, uh, Hong Kong is my uh, hometown. I grew up here, and uh, basically I like everything in Hong Kong, except one thing, and that is the food in Hong Kong. Uh, the reason is that, uh, well, every time I come here, I tend to eat too much. I just cannot resist the temptation of uh, tasting more food in Hong Kong. So every time I leave Hong Kong, I would uh, have uh, gained uh, several pounds. And, uh, and every time I return uh, back to the US, I try to blame myself for not uh, being strong enough to resist the temptation. Uh, but uh, now, uh, uh, I would like to uh, take this opportunity to stand up, uh, do some kind of exercise to uh, uh, lose some of the weight that I gained from the dinner tonight. And unfortunately, I just ate too much tonight. Now, uh, the uh, talk that I uh, would like to deliver tonight is about not just the One Belt, One Road initiative, uh, but also some other things related to this initiative. Uh, something about, uh, say, uh, doing business, uh, making money, and also trying to uh, resist uh, or reduce the risk uh, associated with uh, doing business in some of the countries uh, included in the initiative. Okay. So I hope, uh, well, uh, after tonight's talk, uh, you would uh, know more about the initiative, and in case uh, you are thinking of investing in some of these countries, uh, maybe uh, tonight's talk will give you a big, better picture of uh, what uh, is lying ahead. So uh, the talk here, uh, I'll try to give you a summary of uh, what I am uh, going to talk about. Okay. So basically, uh, I'll try to describe what the One by One Road initiative is, and then uh, I'll try to have a discussion uh, of uh, uh, the economic impacts of the initiative on uh, the countries along the roads and also on China and some of the countries that are not along the roads. And then I'll try to talk about, uh, well, what kind of uh, business opportunities that we can expect and uh, also uh, uh, how to manage the risks uh, associated with investing in uh, some of these countries. Well, uh, probably you may have heard of the One Bell One Road initiative uh, many times because uh, it seems to be one of the hottest issues uh, in Hong Kong, in China, and in some other countries as well. Uh, so as a result of that, probably you don't need me to uh, repeat some of the things that you have heard before, uh, but uh, I still have to uh, give you a rough picture of what that initiative, uh, in order to highlight uh, the economic impacts uh, that I am going to talk about. So, uh, well, the initiative is a huge project. Okay, you know that probably. And uh, it was proposed at the end of uh, 2013, uh, which is, the, well, slightly more than two years ago. Okay. Uh, so it's not too long ago, uh, but uh, within these two years, uh, a lot of things have happened. And uh, we can say that, uh, well, the initiative has already started in some of the countries. 
Uh, so basically, um, the um, uh, initiative can be described by uh, the uh, land Silk Road and uh, also the Maritime Silk Road. So let's uh, look at a picture, or let's look at a map uh, of what uh, this initiative is about. Uh, so the map shows uh, basically, well, the land Silk Road and also the Maritime Silk Road. So the land road is about, well, the connection uh, uh, between the China and some of the European countries, uh, going through a lot of countries using mainly high-speed railway. Okay, so basically, uh, the land Silk Road uh, is to move people and uh, commodities faster from China to Europe or from Europe to China. And uh, the, if you look at the land, land Silk Road, well, basically, it is not just one road, although the uh, English name is one road, uh, but basically, it has many routes or routes, okay? Uh, because, uh, well, there are just uh, more than one way of going from China to Europe, okay? So from uh, here, you can see that, uh, well, uh, we have the upper uh, path, the middle path, and also the lower path uh, connecting China and Europe. Uh, and in addition to that, we can have the maritime sail road uh, moving uh, goods and people uh, by sea. Okay. So if we want to describe uh, what, the that, what that initiative is, well, basically, we just, we just say that the initiative is trying to move people and commodities uh, faster uh, more directly from China to Europe and Europe to China. But of course, uh, when we say China and Europe, uh, we should not neglect some of the countries in between. Okay? So uh, we have the Central Asia, uh, West Asia, uh, Middle East, uh, Eastern Europe, and so on. So basically, there are altogether 63 countries, or maybe more, okay, uh, in between uh, you, uh, China and Europe, okay? And in order to ship people and commodities from one end to the other end, we have to go through these countries. Now, according to uh, at least one article, uh, uh, there are altogether 63 countries that can be identified. But strictly speaking, the number is not fixed because it all depends on uh, how the roads are to, uh, to be built and uh, how uh, many countries would be involved. So the number 63 is not fixed, uh, but at least for the time being, we can use 63 as uh, the base, okay? And try to see, well, how many countries would be involved uh, in the initiative. Uh, here I have a table showing, um, well, the relative sizes of the uh, countries. And um, so basically, I try to uh, group all these 63 countries into several groups, um, the Southeast Asia, uh, Central Asia, uh, South Asia, West Asia, um, or Middle East, uh, Eastern Europe, and even Africa, and also, of course, Russia and Mongolia as well. Okay? Uh, so you can see from the table that, uh, well, basically, uh, there are, there are GDPs are of, uh, well, considerable sizes in uh, the percentage of the GDP in the world's GDP is also given here. Uh, I also uh, showed the uh, China's share in the world's GDP. And you can see something like, uh, say, 13 to 14 percent. And out of all these 63 countries, and of course, China's size is the biggest. Uh, that is, of course, uh, easy to understand, okay? So you can see that, well, uh, when we say that trying to move goods from China to Europe, so that is exactly what we are trying to say. And the countries in between are much smaller, okay? Uh, and as a result of that, the focus is on China and Europe. And after all, that is uh, the original idea of the Asian Silk Road. Okay, so we are using that term here to describe uh, the, uh, the objective of this modern Silk Road. Okay. 
Okay, now, in order to have a better understanding of this uh, initiative, here I used a diagram, okay, a graph, symbol graph, to show exactly what we may expect for each of these 63 countries. So here, uh, you can see that, uh, well, uh, I try to count uh, the event starting from 2014, because uh, the initiative was uh, proposed uh, in November, October and then November of 2013. So we forget about the, the one or two months uh, in 2013. So I start counting in 2014, and uh, now we are somewhere here. So this is where we are, here. And zero would uh, be the starting point for a particular country when uh, a high-speed uh, railway would be built, okay, and, uh, or a seaport would be built, and then it would take about three, four, or even five years you know, to finish uh, the high-speed railway or the seaport. So I put um, three plus somewhere here, okay, that signifies uh, the end of the project. Okay, so roughly speaking, uh, we can have stage one here, and stage two and stage three, depending on where we start, we begin uh, the project and where we end the project. Okay, now this would be uh, useful for us in analyzing uh, the economic impacts and also the uh, business opportunities, uh, something that I'm going to describe later. Okay, now these three stages actually have names, or at least I can give them names. Okay. Uh, Stage one would be the stage in which we start promote the uh, initiative, and uh, we uh, would have uh, the Chinese government negotiating with some of the go uh, uh, the governments of some of these countries. Okay, so that this is the stage when we have promotion and negotiation, and then uh, in uh, uh, in uh, stage two we have the construction of the facilities. As facilities here uh, refer to the high-speed railway and uh, also seaports, airports, roads, uh, uh, lo logistic uh, uh, facilities, and uh, so on. Okay. And then uh, when we start finishing uh, uh, the uh, construction of the project, then we would enter stage three. Now, stage three is the post-construction stage. Now, this stage would be very important uh, when we talk about the, the economic impacts. Okay. The reason is that stage three would cover the time after the complexion of the uh, facility, and it can go on forever. So it can cover 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Uh, so starting from stage three, the economic relations between China um, and these countries, and also Europe, would be entirely different. Now, I'll talk about that later. Okay, okay now, uh, we are in the promotion and negotiation stage. Okay, so basically, um, it would be a stage uh, carried out by the Chinese government. Okay, uh, if you pay attention to what uh, prime, uh, premier of, uh, the Chinese pr premier would be doing when he visits uh, some of the countries, then you know that he is not just the premier of China, but also the salesman, salesperson of high-speed railway uh, for China. Okay, so every time he goes to, to a, a, a new country, uh, then he would try to promote uh, the high-speed uh, railway. Okay, now that shows uh, that, uh, well, this is the top priority of China. Uh, in establishing and uh, in improving the economic relations between China and some of these countries. Okay. And, uh, well, this is the, uh, well, uh, a stage uh, carried out mainly by the Chinese government. So, in some sense, uh, that is not too much that we can do and not too much we have to um, uh, worry about. Okay, okay now, well, uh, China, or at least... Uh, 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 the premier of China, okay, when talking about the high-speed railway uh, with uh, some of these countries, he actually received a, a, a very warm welcome and uh, high interest 
uh, in, uh, the, in building up uh, uh, the high-speed railway in their own country. Now, why is that? Okay. Now, China has some uh, assets okay, uh, in when promoting uh, this high-speed railway. Uh, first one is the track record. Okay. Uh, now, if you pay attention to the, the high-speed railway, and of, of course, the Hong Kong is uh, the, the southern end of a line going to Beijing. Uh, within the 10 years, so basically, China built up a huge network of uh, uh, high-speed railway uh, in China, and uh, that is our world record. Okay? And now, uh, the length of the entire uh, high-speed railway network in China is more than what uh, the total length of high-speed uh, railway in the rest of the world. So actually, Hong, uh, China's uh, network occupied uh, uh, around 60% of the, all the high-speed railway in the world. Okay. Now, that's one thing. Another thing is that, uh, well, uh, I'm not sure whether you are aware of that. The longest bridge in the world is in China, and it is part of the uh, high-speed railway, railway uh, between the Shanghai and Beijing. Now, that is the longest uh, bridge in the world. And how about the second one? Also in China. And how about the third one? Well, also in China. And all these three bridges were built in the last 10 years. Okay, so within 10 years, uh, China has established a lot. Okay, and when China uh, wants to uh, convince other countries to build similar uh, high-speed railways, China can show its uh, track record and can show uh, its experience, can show its achievement to other countries. Okay? And uh, later, I'll uh, uh, go over the uh, Indonesian case uh, showing a successful story of China. Okay? Uh, later, okay. Now, and of course, the China not just uh, the ex not have uh, not just the ex experience, but also well money. Okay. Now, China because of this, China uh, set up uh, the Asian uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank with uh, um, uh, with uh, a, a total capital of ten ten uh, no one hundred billion U.S. billion uh, dollars. Okay, now that is uh, not very much money, but it's still a lot to me. Okay, uh, but uh, at least that can be used uh, 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 mainly for the construction of high-speed railway and seaports. Okay, in Asia. Okay, and uh, so that uh, that is why that when uh, other countries have heard about uh, the uh, high-speed railway. Well, they not, uh, are thinking of getting the money from the AIIB. Okay. Well, in fact, uh, China was never shy of uh, saying that uh, the AIIB is related to this One Belt, One Road initiative. Okay. Now, in addition to that, China established uh, the Silk Road in Infrastructure Fund. So China put up a, 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 a big sum of money, 40 US, uh, 40, yes, your U.S. Uh, billion dollars, okay, particularly for establishing infrastructure uh, for the Silk Road, okay. So that is why the, uh, when other countries um, have heard about uh, these, uh, they would try to, well, actually they would try to uh, convince China to come to them first, okay, because they know that, uh, well, China is not having just empty words. Uh, but uh, with experience and money uh, in the pocket, now that, uh, that means a lot. Okay, okay now, uh, in fact, uh, uh, if we read uh, newspaper articles, we can see that, well, actually many countries have been showing uh, uh, great interest in uh, the initiative. Okay. Uh, today, I uh, just read one article uh, describing Vietnam's interest in the initiative, okay? Now, wh why is this news uh, uh, strange, okay, or very interesting? The reason is that, uh, well, China, you, 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 you may have heard that, uh, well, Vietnam has been, well, 
has been against uh, uh, China in many uh, things, okay? Uh, not just the South, uh, in the, 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 the South China Sea, but in other things as well. So initially, uh, Vietnam didn't show too much interest in the initiative. And if you look at the map of Southeast Asia, you can see that, uh, well, China has the plan, uh, a grand plan of uh, building uh, a, a railway network from uh, Kunming uh, uh, in uh, Yunnan, okay, in, in, well, Yunnan, okay, going down to Singapore, okay. So to, to, trying to build a, a, net, uh, a railway network going down to uh, Singapore. Now, if that has been uh, completed, all these countries, uh, uh, Singapore, uh, M Malaysia, Thailand, uh, uh, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, and also uh, uh, Myanmar, Myanmar, okay, would be connected economically to, uh, to, to China, okay. Uh, initially, uh, Vietnam was not uh, too, or at least didn't show much interest. And in fact, uh, one of the uh, uh, railway lines uh, going from Yunnan to uh, Singapore is to pass through Vietnam. But that part has not been started and uh, we are not sure whether Vietnam uh, would uh, like that kind of construction. So far we have uh, a, 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 a line, a railway line from Yunnan to, uh, to, to, to Laos. Okay? And uh, Thailand is uh, trying to, uh, build, to, to, to build the second uh, foot of uh, the, the line before going from Bangkok to uh, Singapore, okay? Now there's also a west line, okay, passing through uh, Myanmar, okay? Uh, but uh, now, uh, to today's news is that uh, Vietnam at least expressed an interest in uh, having uh, such a rail line going from uh, Yunnan to uh, Singapore. So, okay, so what we can see is that actually people, uh, countries, have been uh, showing various interest in having uh, the initiative, in having the high-speed railway going through their countries, okay? Okay, now, um, so, okay, so now, unfortunately, I don't have uh, time to um, collect uh, all these uh, information which exists uh, piece by piece, okay? Uh, so you need to have some time, some people to collect uh, in re relevant information, okay? Now, uh, now, in stage two, we have the construction of the, um, uh, the high-speed railway. Uh, that means we have to inject money, investment money into the country. So suppose that uh, we are talking about, say, uh, Kazakhstan, which is uh, on the western part of China, okay? So we, have, we want to build a, a, a high-speed railway through Kazakhstan, okay? Now, Kazakhstan, we, we have already a railway, uh, but uh, it is a uh, low-speed uh, railway uh, passing through uh, Kazakhstan to Europe, okay? Uh, but uh, if we want to have this initiative, we may have to build a new uh, uh, railway uh, using high-speed trains, okay? Uh, now, if you want to build such a, a new uh, railway, we have to invest money, okay? And then the money would come probably partly from the AIB and partly from uh, the uh, Silk Road Infrastructure Fund, okay? Uh, no matter where the, what the source is, uh, we would expect that, well, we have to inject money into the economy, okay? Now, uh, that means that the local economy is going to receive some form of foreign direct investment. Uh, that should be good for the local economy. Now, I'll talk more about that uh, later. Okay. And, uh, well, the technical side, of course, would come from China's uh, technology. Okay. Now, that is something uh, we don't have to worry about because uh, that's nothing I know about. Okay. Uh, and, uh, but in addition to the construction of the rail, rail, uh, railway lines, uh, we would have uh, big demand for uh, other associated commodities, okay? 
uh, something like, uh, say, a screw, okay, or a, 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 a chair, or uh, uh, some, something like that. Well, in order to complete uh, the construction of uh, the high-speed uh, railway, we need a lot of things, okay. Now, of course, the part of the things we come from China, but part of the, uh, some of the parts may come from some other countries. Now, if the money comes from AIIB, there has been a saying that all those investment projects would give priority to the members of the AIIB. Okay, meaning that uh, well, if you are, have a country in uh, say in uh, say uh, uh, Germany, okay. Uh, maybe you would uh, have uh, received some kind of priority as a supplier to some of the goods needed for the construction of the rail, rail, rail lines. Okay? And uh, that is, in fact, one obvious reason why so many countries are interested in uh, being a member of the AIB. Now, if you uh, go back to uh, last year to uh, actually, maybe more than one year ago, to see how the AIIB was formed, you will see that, uh, well, initially, the response was not that big, and uh, the story was that, uh, well, the U.S. has been uh, trying to uh, discourage some of the countries from uh, joining the AIIB, and then uh, toward the end of uh, March last year, uh, the many countries uh, tried to join in and to become the founding members of the bank, okay, and uh, Germany was the, well, joined uh, uh, the uh, bank uh, within the, in in the last week of uh, May of March, okay. Now, one probably one uh, reason why they are so much interested in being a member of the AIB is that well, their companies would receive some kind of priority in uh, supplying parts in uh, materials and uh, products uh, to the projects financed by the AIB, okay? And uh, as a result of that, uh, well, if you have a com company in one of these countries, then probably you should pay attention to what is going on in the AIB and also in the initiative, okay? Okay, now here, I, uh, let me give you an example, uh, a case study of uh, what may happen uh, in the future for some of the countries when uh, China is building uh, the um, uh, high-speed uh, railway, okay? And that is uh, the Jakarta uh, Bandung uh, 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 line, okay? Uh, the line is an interesting case, although actually that line is not part of the land Silk Road because, uh, well, uh, Indonesia uh, is the uh, is it, uh, we are talking about the, the Java Island of Indonesia. It is away from the Land Silk Road. So this is not part of the Land Silk Road, but uh, this can uh, show what we can, what we may expect from future uh, high-speed railway to be built uh, from China to Germany. Okay, uh, because uh, here we are trying to uh, China is trying to build a high-speed railway. Okay. Uh, between uh, Jakarta, which is the uh, capital of Indonesia, and also the largest city in uh, in in in, uh, in the country. Okay, uh, Bandung actually uh, is the, the third largest city uh, in uh, Indonesia, and uh, both of the cities are in uh, the Java Island. Okay. Now uh, the the uh, uh, the railway. Okay was uh, first, actually, was first suggested by Japan back in 2008. So uh, the uh, Japanese government uh, tried to promote the, the bullet train okay, uh, uh, technology and tried to uh, convince the uh, Indonesian government uh, that they should build a, a, a high-speed railway. Okay. And then uh, back in 2014, Suddenly, China jumped in and uh, tried to uh, 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 make a new proposal. Okay, so as a result of that, the Indonesian government has uh, had two proposals in front of it, and uh, then uh, it can choose between these two. And eventually, uh, China 
uh, one the game, okay. So uh, Indonesian uh, government uh, uh, accepted uh, China's uh, proposal. Okay. Now let's uh, try to see uh, what uh, China is proposing. Okay. And uh, so uh, the sign, the signing of the uh, contract was uh, uh, in uh, October uh, 2015. So basically, shortly after, uh, or maybe about a year after China submitted a proposal, uh, China won the case. Okay. And uh, what that is, is that, uh, well, the distance is a very short one. It's only 150 kilometer, which is uh, not too long. Okay. And uh, that is why some people argue that maybe the distance is, uh, is not long enough and it does not justify the building up uh, of uh, uh, the building of a uh, high-speed railway. Uh, but uh, you have to keep in mind that, well, this can be regarded as the first part of first leg of uh, a long uh, high-speed railway uh, uh, from Jakarta to uh, the second city. Uh, I forgot the na an English name of that city. Uh, 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 they say so. Some names so you go say. There is the second uh, the largest city in uh, Indonesia. So basically, the fi uh, final plan is to complete uh, the construction of the railway. Okay, but at least for this short um, part of the entire rail line, uh, it would take about uh, four, three years to uh, complete. Okay, and uh, the. Uh, the total investment uh, would be uh, 5.5 uh, billion US dollars. Okay, but well, that is, in some sense, uh, not too much money uh, yeah, using the standard of high-speed railway. Okay, uh, but uh, the good part, the something that we should pay attention to is that such a high-speed railway would reduce the uh, the time to travel from one city to another from three hours to about 40 minutes, okay? Now that is a reduction of the time of the transportation by about, um, say, uh, 30, uh, 70%, okay, 77%. Okay, so in that case, uh, you can see uh, the magic or the benefits that uh, we can get from such a high-speed railway. Now, I will uh, use the, some, uh, some of the numbers here, you know, to help us understand what uh, the initiative may be in the future, okay? Okay, now uh, there are two roads, uh, okay, land, okay, and um, maritime. Now, land basically uh, uh, is, refers to the high-speed railway, okay? Uh, because uh, we want to move goods and people faster from China to Europe, okay? Now, of course, for people, they can fly, okay? Uh, but uh, for goods, Okay, it's not easy, that easy to fly, okay, especially you, if you are talking about some bulky things like machines, cars, and uh, things like that, okay. So you still have to rely on trains, okay. And if that is the case, then of course you want to move the goods faster, okay. And that is what the Land Seal Road is about. And basically, there are the upper one, upper route, okay, uh, upper route, whatever, okay, and the middle one, and then the lower, lower one, okay. And uh, the exact uh, 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 line actually has not been fixed yet. So uh, that would require further investigation, okay, uh, later. So uh, at least right now, this uh, is the plan, okay. And uh, another one, uh, the Maritime uh, Silk Road refers to the construction of uh, seaports, airports, uh, and, uh, and so on, okay. Uh, but one thing you may want to pay attention to is that, uh, well, the maritime Silk Road is not about time that much, okay. Now, wh when we look at land, we are talking about high-speed rail railway. Uh, high-speed railway would substantially reduce the, the time of travel, okay. Uh, but uh, for the maritime Silk Road, we are not talking too much about time because uh, we, we are not having, we are not going to have some high-speed ships or container ships from China to Europe. What we are talking about here in terms of the maritime Silk Road is that we build 
uh, seaports, okay, and airports, uh, high, uh, highways, and also these logistic uh, facilities, and so on. So the purpose of the maritime Silk Road is uh, not to reduce the, the time, but to allow more countries to be involved. Okay. Now, I, uh, would, uh, I can give you an example. Uh, a very important point of uh, the uh, maritime Silk Road is Colombo in Sri Lanka. Okay. Uh, Sri Lanka, you know where it is, it's just the eye drop of uh, India. Okay. And uh, now, if China buys oil from uh, a Middle East uh, country, like Saudi Arabia, okay, now the ship would go uh, uh, straight from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, Middle East and then uh, uh, through Singapore and then uh, go, go up to China. Okay. Now, that ship probably would not have a stop in Sri Lanka. But now, China is uh, trying to build uh, a, a modern seaport in Colombo, which is the capital of Sri Lanka. And uh, after building up uh, that uh, uh, seaport, uh, then future ships from uh, Middle East to China may have a stop there in Sri Lanka. Now, what is the impact of that? Well, that means that Sri Lanka will be involved in China's trade with uh, Middle East or Europe and so on. And that, of course, would help have, would have Sri Lanka. And uh, that would also help uh, improve uh, the economic relations between uh, Sri Lanka and China, and also Sri Lanka and some uh, of these European countries, uh, Middle East countries, and so on. Okay, so the purpose uh, or the major effect of uh, the maritime Silk Road is to connect all these ports, seaports and countries together so that, uh, well, they would have more train, more uh, interactions and so on. Okay. So the, I, I, the, the, the uh, direct effects of the land Silk Road and the maritime Silk Road actually are different. Okay. Okay, economic impacts. Okay, so um, uh, try to talk about the economic impacts. Okay, now, why, why are we interested in knowing the economic impacts? Okay, so it, it, you know, in order to convince these countries to join the initiative, you must convince th these countries that they are going to benefit from this, from the initiative. Otherwise, why would they be interested in? being part of it, okay? So you must convince them that this is a good thing for them. Now, probably that is not too difficult to, um, to, to convince them. The reason is that many of these countries actually are un underdeveloped or developing, and they need a lot of foreign investment. They need a lot of uh, infrastructure in order to improve the economy. They know all this, okay? And, uh, so probably uh, we don't need too much to tell them, you know, to convince them. And, but, uh, well, if we can identify the economic impact uh, exactly, well, how your uh, economy may be able to benefit from the initiative, now I think that would make your argument even more convincing. Now, to make it even more and more convincing is if you can come up with some numbers, okay? So something like that, like this. Okay. So suppose that uh, the, the China's the uh, premier is going to convince one of these, these countries to that. Okay. Now you should have a, a high-speed railway. And uh, also, I can tell you that well, according to the estimate of my economist, okay, uh, your economy is going to have your GDP increased by say ten percent or something like that. Okay. Now, if you can come up with a number like that, and if that number is substantial enough, is big enough, uh, then you would make your case even stronger. Okay? So that is why we are interested in knowing the economic impacts of the initiative. Not just, the, well, it is the initiative. Now we want to know how that initiative may affect different countries. Okay, okay now, uh, the economic impacts actually 
uh, depends on the stages of the initiative. So in different stages, because uh, we would expect something different, and therefore uh, the initiative may have different uh, economic impacts. Okay. Now let's go over uh, the stages and see how each of these stages may affect the countries. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, unfortunately, here I can only offer some analytical framework. Okay. So I can tell you that well, uh, how, how we can uh, measure these impacts. Okay. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't have the t time to uh, do the actual empirical estimation. Okay. But uh, at least uh, maybe sometime in the future, or by me, by some other people, and so on, we can try to measure. Uh, the figures, in terms of figures, uh, numbers, okay, how different countries uh, may be affected. Okay. okay, now, we look at, um, again, that uh, same uh, diagram, but a slightly different one, because here I want to emphasize um, what may happen, okay, in uh, uh, finishing the initiative, okay. So here we, here we are, so we are here, okay, and uh, and uh, this is the time when the project starts, okay? Uh, but before, sometime before the, uh, the uh, project starts, uh, uh, the AIB or China or whatever would have inject money into the economy. So the economy actually would feel the initiative sometime before the, uh, the start of the, uh, of the initiative, okay? So this is the injection of fund, and then after that, uh, we would uh, the construction would be somewhere here, okay, and then uh, after that, uh, maybe three years later or even five years later, uh, depending on length of the railway, uh, we would have the high-speed railway completed, and uh, once we have that, then that w uh, then we would look at the, the uh, trade possibly trade and some cultural exchanges, economic exchanges between uh, that country and some neighbor, neighboring countries as well. Okay, so that is the time uh, uh, the uh, country would uh, begin a new stage and we would uh, see some new economic impacts. Okay. Okay, now, uh, so let's uh, begin with uh, the case of uh, the injection of investment fund, okay. Uh, so uh, the impact would be mainly on the local economy. So we uh, uh, send money to the economy and then uh, we try to build uh, our high-speed railway. Now, in most cases, actually, China has mentioned that uh, China, uh, in building uh, the high-speed railway, uh, China would uh, try to use uh, local workers as much as possible, okay? Now, if that is the case, then you would expect that, well, when uh, the project starts, okay, uh, then the employment situation in the local economy would be improved, okay? Now, that, of course, is good for the economy. Now, in addition to that, the injection of money would mean what some macroeconomic effects, okay, so basically, you have uh, uh, foreign money, and then that would increase the aggregate demand, okay? And uh, when you have more money, uh, then you would create some multiplier effect, okay? So the uh, total uh, impacts on the local economy may actually greater than the initial amount of the fund injected into the economy, okay? Now that would be uh, quite uh, important, okay? Okay, so these are the macroeconomic impacts. Okay, uh, I uh, there's an estimate of uh, number uh, the number of workers to be employed, uh, but I don't have the, um, uh, the number with me. Uh, or here, maybe I, I can mention that uh, actually I'm uh, uh, writing a paper on the uh, one bell one row initiative for volume on the Asian Pacific economies. Okay, so in case uh, you are interested in uh, this. Uh, you uh, you're welcome to send me an email. Uh, then I can send you a copy of that paper when it is um, ready. Okay. And then that, that paper would have a lot of uh, more examples and more numbers. Okay. Uh, another um, uh, possible impact is on the economic growth of the economy. Okay. Now, when we have the high-speed uh, railway, 
say, through Pakistan, okay? Actually, this is just a line of uh, the train, okay, through the country. Uh, there may be two or three stops inside th that particular country. Uh, but then for the economy, uh, in particular, the long-term impacts, okay, you would expect that, uh, well, only those uh, neighboring areas close to a station would be affected, okay, more directly, okay. Uh, but that actually, that is not the end of the story because uh, once you have a high-speed train station there, obviously you want to build some connecting roads, some connecting uh, train uh, train lines, and so on. Okay, and uh, therefore that would call for more investment, uh, at least in the areas close to a uh, high-speed train st uh, station. Okay. So that push, in some sense, that would push uh, the local government to invest more, uh, either through borrowing money or through local raising, uh, raising of local money or whatever. Okay. Now, as a result of that, we would expect that the high-speed uh, rail, railway line actually uh, could uh, lead to further investment, and uh, this further investment would improve the flow of resources uh, within the economy. And we know that, uh, well, if you uh, 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 increase the flexibility and the degree of freedom of movement of resources, uh, then you are moving closer to something we call the production possibility frontier. That pro uh, production possibility frontier, the PPF, shows the potential of production of the economy. And initially, you may be at a point uh, quite below the PPF uh, because, uh, well, uh, resources cannot move so freely, okay? So you don't have efficient uh, uh, allocation of resources. But now, through the high-speed train, through uh, some local uh, trains, through some local roads and so on, so resources can, can move more, uh, much uh, uh, freely, okay? Much faster, uh, much more easily uh, within the economy. Now that would uh, help the production point to move closer to the PPF, okay? Now that is something we call the economic growth, okay? And also, if uh, we can have the improvement of the local economy, we can encourage people to get more education, uh, to encourage uh, the economy to have more physical capital accumulation, and so on, and now maybe the uh, local firms will be able to get some uh, improvement in technology through technology transfer, through innovation, through imitation, and so on. And then we would expect that, well, now the economy has an improvement in its technology level, and that is one of the factors of economic growth. So that is why uh, the, the, the initiative would have this kind of effect. Okay. And, um, okay, now, let, let it, we come to the last stage. After the con uh, complexion of the, um, uh, the high-speed railway. So we have then the preferential trade um, uh, treatment. Okay, now what does that mean? Okay, now what that means is that the high-speed railway actually is helping uh, all the countries in, along the road in moving goods. Okay, so that, well, one of the car, car countries, when trying to buy a car from Germany, then they can pay less, okay? They can get the, the car faster. So that would encourage them to uh, buy, import more cars from, Japan, uh, from Germany. Uh, so that is uh, good for trade, okay? But unfortunately, countries not along the uh, land Silk Road would not uh, be able to receive that kind of uh, favorable treatment. Now, another example is Japan. Okay? They may buy a car from Japan as well, but unfortunately, Japan is not on the Silk Road. And as a result of that, if they continue to buy cars from Japan, they would not expect any reduction in the time, in the cost, and so on. Now, that is what we call preferential trade treatment. Okay. Now, that kind of treatment is the result of this land zero uh, and also maritime zero as well. And uh, that would 
affect the pattern of trade and also the volumes of trade for uh, these countries. Okay, now, uh, the Silk Road, well, generally would reduce the time okay, uh, of transportation, okay, and uh, therefore that is good for trade between that country and some other countries, and uh, that would improve trade, uh, the volume of trade, and the effect uh, of that is what we usually call trade creation. Okay, so we have trade creation. Okay. And, uh, but unfortunately, uh, uh, that would be against trade with uh, countries like Japan or the US, okay, because they are not on the Silk Road. Okay. Now, uh, the uh, Jakarta, uh, uh, Bandan uh, case that I uh, just described actually shows that well, when building up a high-speed um, railway can reduce uh, the time for transportation by something like, uh, say, 77%. Now, that is a lot, okay? Now, that is, of course, because, uh, because we are having high-speed railway. So, that is the meaning of high speed, okay? Okay, now, if that is the case, um, uh, we can reduce the, the time for moving goods from Germany to China. Okay, okay now, uh, because uh, China, uh, Japan and uh, the US are not on the uh, land sea road, and as a result of that, uh, they would uh, have some negative impacts uh, in terms of the volume of trade uh, between them and also some of these countries. Now, this is what we call trade diversion. Okay, so trade in some sense is diverted from Japan to Germany. Germany is receiving that preferential trade treatment. Okay, okay now um, the maritime Silk Road actually may not have a similar effects, but as I mentioned earlier, uh, maritime Silk Road actually is to help uh, uh, some of these countries uh, more connected. Okay. So as a result of that, uh, maybe we can consider again the Sri Lanka case. Maybe initially, uh, Sri Lanka may not have that kind of incentive in buying cars from Germany because, uh, well, if they want to do that, they would have to order a uh, certain number of cars from Germany directly. But now, because of the maritime Silk Road, uh, the ship from, uh, from uh, Europe uh, going to uh, China may have a stop in uh, Sri Lanka. So as a result of that, Sri Lanka would feel that, well, the cost of getting cars from Germany is not that high. Maybe now I want to buy some cars from Germany. Okay. Now that is, of course, is a good thing for Germany. But on the other hand, Sri Lanka can also take advantage of this to sell goods to Germany. So goods can flow in both directions. Okay. So something we can therefore expect, okay? Okay, now, uh, one example of uh, trade creation and diversion may be uh, something I have already mentioned. So, uh, China uh, uh, buys imports, uh, machines, and also cars, and so on, uh, from Germany, okay? And, uh, uh, and also from Japan, but unfortunately, the difference between Germany and Japan is that one is on the Silk Road and the other one is not. Okay. Uh, so right now, well, we do have train lines running from Germany to China. But now, uh, the currently, this line is very inefficient. And also because of the uh, customs, uh, decoration, and so on for the goods uh, passing from one country to another is very clumsy uh, and uh, it takes time and therefore um, it was uh, reported that to ship a car or a machine from Germany to China would take about 18 days. Okay. Uh, but uh, suppose that uh, well we built, uh, we, we have connected uh, the high-speed railway and uh, if uh, we uh, use the Jakarta uh, Bandung um, uh, case as an example, uh, then we would expect that uh, well, the time for moving the uh, machine from Germany to uh, China can be reduced to maybe four or five days. Now that is a huge 
uh, improvement in terms of the time for uh, transportation. Okay. Now, and also that would uh, have a big impact on the volume of trade. So maybe, well, China now wants to buy more machines from, Japan, uh, from Germany. Uh, but poor Japan, because Japan is not on the road, so, so in that case, uh, China may shift some of its import from Japan to uh, an import from Germany. Now, this is what we call trade diversion. Okay? So uh, in this case, we can have trade creation and trade diversion. Trade creation would be good for all those countries along the road, uh, but uh, trade diversion would be bad for uh, some other countries. Okay. Okay, so, uh, well, trade uh, creation and also trade diversion, something I uh, just ex explained, okay. And uh, also, uh, we uh, would expect that, uh, well, in general, trade uh, creation would be good for all those countries, uh, but trade diversion uh, may be bad for some outside countries, okay. Okay, now, um, this kind of trade is what we call strategic trade, okay. So, in that case, uh, in this case, uh, Germany and Japan are competing in uh, China's market, okay. They want to get a, a, a market share uh, as big as possible. Uh, so, that is why that we call this a kind of a strategic trade, uh, because they are competing with each other, okay. And uh, so, in terms of strategic trade, uh, then we would expect that, well, it tends to benefit some uh, local uh, countries, the countries along the line, uh, but uh, it could be at the expense of some outside countries. Okay, so that is something we, could, uh, we would expect. But in addition to that, we can have the pure import case. Okay, so in terms of China, okay, it is buying machines from uh, Germany uh, or from uh, Japan, okay, and now uh, the Silk Road is uh, helping some uh, uh, countries along the road, uh, probably at the expense of um, some outside countries. So the, the question is, well, whether that is a good thing for China, okay? Now, uh, previously, I, I argued that, uh, well, that case may be good for Germany because Germany is receiving more business, more trade with China, okay? But from China's point of view, is, a, is it a good idea to buy more cars or more sh machines from Germany instead of from Japan, okay? Now, in general, we are not actually, we're not so sure about this. Uh, we have some positive e uh, effects and some negative effects. And whether it's good or bad for a particular commodity, well, probably this is an empirical question. So we would have to uh, carry out some uh, research and study in order to find out exactly how China may be affected in the case of pure import. Okay. And uh, also, we can have uh, some other types of trade. One thing is uh, intra industry trade. Okay. So suppose that there are some uh, machines uh, or some even some uh, some, some types of cars, okay, China is producing and also exporting to uh, some other countries, okay. And, uh, and at the same time, some other countries may also be exporting similar products to China. So in that case, China may be exporting and importing similar products at the same time. Uh, one example is, is what? Uh, smartphone, uh, maybe uh, computers, uh, some types of machines and so on, uh, camera or whatever. Okay, so basically, it is quite common that a country is exporting and importing uh, goods that are similar to each other and also that are uh, usually grouped within the same industry. Now, this is what we call intra-industry trade. And now, if uh, for some of the goods that are having intra-industry trade between China and some other countries along the line, so the question is, having this kind of uh, high-speed railway, is it a good or a bad idea for China? Well, again, th this is an empirical question because, uh, well, uh, we can identify some positive effects and also some negative effects. So in general, we are not uh, so sure. Okay. Now, it, it seems that uh, well, anything can happen, but actually they, it is not. Uh, we can have a theoretical uh, framework 
to help us understand or identify uh, these uh, positive effects and these negative effects, and then we can actually carry out uh, empirical estimation. But what it needs would be some uh, data, okay? Uh, but unfortunately, the data are not that uh, available uh, online. Uh, we, at least we have to spend an RA to get an RA to get the data. So unfortunately, uh, I don't uh, have uh, any numbers with me, but at least, uh, well, you can have a concept, conceptual understanding of how different countries may be affected for different types of trade. Okay, now let me turn to the business opportunities. Okay. Now, of course, uh, I uh, am not a business person, uh, so I do not know business that much. Uh, but I think uh, the um, uh, initiative uh, uh, is a huge project, affecting so many, so many uh, countries and for so many years and uh, in many industries. And therefore, uh, a lot of business opportunities, opportunities must be created and that is why we need to pay attention to this. And uh, so I basically, uh, I try to uh, uh, I make use of the uh, stages of the construction here in order to identify the kind of opportunities that we can pay attention to. Okay. And after that, uh, I'll talk about risk, risks and also risk management. Okay, now, here, I would uh, focus more on the construction of the, uh, of, uh, the initiative. So the construction would occur in stage two. Okay? Now, we, in general, we don't know uh, what exactly uh, the length of that stage two is because, uh, well, it depends on where, what kind of uh, railway we are talking about, which country uh, we are talking about, and what is uh, the properties of the land. Okay? Uh, that we are talking about, okay. So we don't know exactly how long it would take, so that is why I put three plus here, okay. So th the, this is the construction of the project. After that, we have trade, okay, something I have uh, explained already. And uh, also, within this uh, range, okay, we have local development. Now that is the macroeconomic effects that I mentioned earlier, okay. So the local economy is going to uh, receive the positive benefits from uh, the initiative because they are, uh, the, the local economy is receiving some investment fund, okay? And it may receive foreign direct investment from outside companies as well, okay? Okay, now let's uh, go over these um, stages, okay, and see uh, what we can expect, okay? Okay, now, uh, so uh, we need to know um, what kind of uh, goods and services would be needed for uh, before a company would be uh, able to uh, determine uh, how it can benefit from the initiative, okay? And uh, so during the promotion and negotiation process uh, stage, well, probably uh, that's not much um, outside companies can do. Now, that is mainly the responsibility and the work of the Chinese government, okay? So for us, well, not much to do. But that does not mean that we don't have to do anything. We actually, if uh, uh, I uh, am, uh, well, uh, uh, a, a potential uh, investment firm here, I would start collecting information and data and, uh, of, uh, of uh, all these uh, countries, okay? So that I know, well, whenever an opportunity arises, I know immediately that, uh, well, what I have to do, okay. Okay, now, during the project construction stage, okay, so basically, uh, uh, you, you, you are going to build high-speed high uh, railway or uh, building uh, seaports and so on. Now, by the project itself, there may not be too much uh, other com companies can do. The project usually would be uh, carried out by the China Railway Construction Corporation, okay? Uh, uh, so basically, that is a, 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 a state uh, a companies, and uh, it would uh, uh, carry out the construction uh, using its own the technology and so on, 
so probably uh, some other country, uh, some of the firms may not be uh, involved too much, okay? Unless they may be able to, uh, uh, the suppliers of some of the parts and materials used for the construction of the uh, railway, okay? Now that is something uh, uh, other countries can do, okay? And uh, furthermore, uh, if the project is being financed by the ARIB, so that was the uh, report that, uh, well, for projects financed by the AIB, uh, companies in the member countries would receive some kind of uh, priority. So that may be something firms would uh, be would want to know, uh, would want to be aware of. Uh, but um, more important would be the local uh, development. So if you still remember the diagram earlier, uh, the local development starts uh, at the time, roughly at the time of uh, the beginning of uh, the construction of the project. The reason is that when foreign com companies or the uh, Chinese government or AIB ingest money into the economy, the economy would get the benefit nearly immediately. Because, uh, well, maybe you send money there and then you hire workers and uh, therefore the workers would receive uh, uh, income and uh, they would spend the income and uh, so on. So the local economy would benefit. Now, that means uh, we have investment opportunities for some outside companies. Okay. Okay, now in the third stage, we have trade. You know? Trade, okay, I just mentioned some examples earlier. Okay, maybe uh, Sri Lanka may uh, want to buy cars from Germany because of the maritime steel road. And uh, now, of course, the, that is good, uh, good news for some of the companies in Germany. But that is not uh, the only thing that we would expect because uh, Sri Lanka may uh, uh, want to buy some, uh, may, buy, uh, we, may want to buy goods from uh, some of the countries along the line, along the road, okay? So in that case, some other countries may also benefit as well, okay? So all these kind of, uh, well, goods and services uh, needed for the complexion of the uh, project and also uh, the trade encouraged by uh, the project uh, would um, call for uh, production of uh, some of these goods uh, to be traded, to be exported, to be imported by some of these countries. And also here we have, um, when uh, we are talking about possible investment, uh, actually we may have two levels of investment. The first level is, of course, for each of the countries, uh, the 63 three countries uh, that we just mentioned earlier, for each of these 63 countries, maybe for a particular company, uh, we may want to, well, uh, determine, well, if I'm going to invest uh, there, for example, Kazakhstan, okay, so if I'm going to uh, invest in Kazakhstan, uh, so how much should I invest, okay? What is the optimal level of investment in, uh, in uh, which industry and, uh, and also how, okay? Now, you determine all this. Okay? Now, that is the first level or the lower level of investment. Now, on top of that, you have the higher level of investment, the second level, okay? And that is companies usually will have a limited uh, 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 money for foreign investment, okay? Uh, it does not mean that uh, we can, you can send as much money, money as you want to other countries for investment, okay? So suppose that you have a fixed sum of money and uh, now you have 63 countries and in each of these countries, you may have already determined how much you are going to invest. Now, what you are going to do in terms of, the, uh, of this fixed sum of money, you have to allocate, you have to allocate this fixed sum of money. So how much money I, I should send to this country? Uh, how much money I should send to another country and so on. Now that is the level uh, we should determine. Now, it seems to be complicated, but of, of course, the, it, it is not. We have, you write up a program, and then you know, we run some uh, computer program, then we can get uh, the result very easily. 
And uh, well, of course, we may have to um, uh, get, uh, be aware of the existence of economies of scale. For example, uh, we may want to invest in India. We may also want to invest Bangladesh. Okay, now maybe you just need an office. Okay, in somewhere in uh, India, say uh, Calcutta. Okay, so you have a, 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 a regional office in Calcutta. Uh, uh, looking over the investment in India and the uh, investment in uh, Bangladesh. Now, this is a kind of economies of scale uh, that, uh, of course, the companies should be aware of. Okay, okay now, uh, let me turn to the last topic okay, of my talk. Okay. I'm already tired. Okay. Uh, but, uh, well, that is about risk management. Okay. And uh, you, 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 you probably don't know the meaning of um, risk management. Uh, that is to identify risks and also to minimize, mitigate uh, the, 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 the risks associated with a particular investment. Okay? Uh, that is the, the risk management that uh, uh, we would be looking at. Now, when we talk about initi the initiative, and also when we are trying to talk about uh, investment uh, because of the initiative, uh, one thing we have to know is that investment is risky. It means that, well, it can ben bring you benefits, it can bring you profits, uh, but uh, the profits sometimes may be negative. That means that you may receive losses. Okay? So uh, investment is risky. Okay? Uh, we, because we don't know about the future. Okay. Uh, and also, investing in a new country is especially risky. The reason is that, uh, well, when you're talking about a new country, uh, then that country may be an entirely unknown thing for you. It's a black hole over there. Okay. So, uh, if you decide uh, if, uh, that you want to invest over there, you may have to face a lot of uh, uncertainty and risks, okay? And uh, that is something you should uh, uh, be aware of. And also, a new country may have a different language, may have uh, some uh, different uh, legal system, uh, different economic system, and uh, different culture, and uh, so on, or different manager, worker relations, and so on. So, this in actually very risky to invest a new country, okay? Uh, but, um, well, of course, the, uh, in order to uh, choose to invest there, uh, you must uh, expect to have high return, okay? Otherwise, uh, you would have no incentive to invest, okay? So, uh, you want to have a high return, and in many cases, uh, you may expect that, uh, well, if things go wrong, uh, go, go right, okay. Uh, then you may have uh, some high reward, okay, uh, hopefully, okay. Okay, now in that case, uh, how can we decide whether we should invest and how can we manage the risks, okay? Now, uh, here I uh, proposed uh, something called the extended expected return approach, okay. Now, uh, the ex expected return approach is something you may uh, be aware of, but I want to extend it, okay, in the sense that, well, uh, we can be more aggressive than uh, what the traditional uh, ex expected return approach would suggest, okay. Now, the expected return approach is based on something like this. So, I use a simple uh, illustration, okay, assuming that there are only two states of nature, the good state and the bad state. Good day means a good day. Uh, bad day means a day like today, uh, raining uh, with a uh, thunderstorm or whatever. Okay, so it is a bad day. Okay, so suppose that you are uh, selling uh, 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 ice cream, then if you have a good day, then you have a lot of customers, uh, then you can do a lot of business. But if you have a day like today, uh, then probably no one would want to buy ice cream from you. So that is a bad day, not just in terms of the weather, but also in terms of your business, okay? So of course, uh, that is only a, a very simple illustration, uh, but uh, we can use that as uh, a way to illustrate uh, how risk can be managed. Okay, now, uh, uh, in order to uh, determine what we can get from this 
uh, investment, when facing these two states of nature, okay, we can have uh, well the return uh, that we can get, okay, or the revenue that would be the revenue for uh, an ice cream ice cream vendor. If you have a good day, so I use G to represent the revenue that you can get uh, uh, from a good day. Okay, B would be the return that you may uh, you would get if you have a bad day. Now B can be negative. Okay, and uh, P is the probability of having uh, the good day. Okay, having a good day. Uh, so if since there's only uh, two states of nature, so if P is the probability of having a good day, then one minus P would be the probability of having a bad day. Okay. Now, uh, if you want to have uh, one more example, then uh, I can uh, uh, use another example. Now, you, uh, I'm, I'm not going to uh, encourage gambling, but uh, something like that. So suppose that you want to throw a dice, okay, and uh, if, uh, then you, you, you come up with a number facing up, okay, with the face, okay, facing up. Now, if you get an uh, even number, so suppose that um, someone is going to give you $100, if you, after throwing a dice, you get, you get an even number. But if you get a, an odd number, uh, then you have to pay another that person one hundred dollars. Okay, so in that case, uh, using this formula, uh, the G is equal to one hundred, B is negative one hundred, P is equal to what? So as long as this is a fair dice, then you have fifty percent chance of getting an even number and fifty percent chance of getting an odd number. So G uh, P in this case is equal to 0 0.5, and also one minus 0 0.5 is 0 0.5. So as a result of that, you substitute all these values into this equation, you get E, which is the expected return of throwing a dice okay, to be zero. Okay. Now, uh, based on this, then the expected return approach would say that you would decide, you would, uh, you would uh, uh, invest if you, if you get uh, an expected return greater than zero. And then you go ahead and invest. Now, in this case, uh, you get uh, uh, an expected return to be zero, uh, which means that, well, you will be indifferent between uh, throwing a dice, uh, 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 gambling, and or doing nothing. Okay, okay now, uh, this is the, the expected return approach, okay? Uh, and also, uh, this uh, approach can be extended to uh, rank two projects. So suppose that you have two projects, and uh, these two projects may have different uh, returns uh, and may be facing different uh, states of nature, and then uh, you can calculate, therefore, the expected returns for uh, these two projects. And then uh, the approach would say that you choose the project uh, that, is, uh, that would give you a higher expected return as long as that expected return is positive okay, or not negative. Okay. So in that case, uh, we can therefore uh, use the, this uh, to try to uh, choose uh, different investment projects. Okay. Now, uh, there are some uh, issues associated with this ap approach. Okay. One is that, uh, well, this approach suggests that the, the decision maker is risk neutral. Risk neutral here means that, well, you are not particular uh, form of uh, risks. You don't like to, uh, you don't enjoy risks, okay? And also, you don't like to avoid risk too much, okay? So, yeah, risk to you it is not, does not mean anything, so that means uh, that, that is why it is called risk neutral. So, this is one assumption behind this approach, okay? Now, I'll talk more, more about this later. Oh, okay, actually, this approach, okay, uh, this assumption actually is not consistent with something that we observe, okay, for people going to casinos, okay, to Macau or whatever. Okay, so you go there and gamble, okay. Uh, but we all know that, uh, well, uh, the odds against the gamblers in all casinos are negative, are uh, against, so the odds are against the gamblers, okay. That means if you go to a casino and gamble, uh, basically, you are losing in the long run. Okay, so if you gamble uh, in, uh, indefinitely, 
okay, then you are going to lose. Okay? Now, if that is the case, uh, that means that uh, uh, when you gamble, then your expected return actually is negative. So if you use this approach, then you will say that, okay, I should not gamble. Okay, now if you follow my advice, uh, then you should not do that, okay? So you should not gamble, okay? Uh, but I'm using this example to uh, raise your interest, maybe, okay? Uh, so we are not able to use this approach to uh, explain gambling. Uh, one way, of course, is to uh, say that, uh, well, uh, people um, like risks, so they are, they, 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 they are risk-loving lovers, okay? And uh, therefore, they uh, get uh, enjoyment from, uh, from taking the risk, okay? And uh, therefore, they are willing to gamble even, even though the uh, expected return is negative, okay? Now, but uh, we, are not, we should not use this uh, argument uh, to explain the behavior of the governments. The reason is that the government is making the, uh, the choice for people. Okay. So in that case, the government should not take uh, too much risks. Okay. So the government should not behave like a gambler and try to enjoy risks. So that is nonsense. nonsense. Okay. So uh, you sh uh, the government should not be risk-loving. And all, on the other hand, govern government should not be too risk-averse. Okay. Meaning that well, you should not avoid too much risk. You should not... Uh, uh, do that, okay? You just uh, take risk neutral, okay? Because uh, you are spending other people's money, okay? So you have to make the good choice. So that's why uh, when we uh, talk about, uh, say, uh, uh, project evaluation, uh, uh, then uh, we can assume uh, that the government is risk neutral. Okay, uh, another issue is uh, the volatility. Uh, that is, uh, well, uh, we may have uh, the expected return like this, uh, but uh, the return may jump up or this or down, um, um, up and so on, so that uh, where the expected return is something like this. Now, if you have two projects, one is, um, uh, one is having a particular expected return, and then you have another project another, uh, of the same expected return, but uh, then for the other project, uh, the return may, may not be so volatile, so maybe it's not uh, moving that much. Now, if you, ha if you know this, then of course, uh, you would choose the one uh, to, uh, uh, with the, uh, uh, that is less volatile, okay? Now, of course, uh, that in some sense, uh, you are away from the risk neutra neutrality assumption, okay? Uh, but uh, at least uh, in the market, we have a way to describe uh, this volatility and how that may affect your uh, decision, and uh, the most important uh, uh, model is what we call the, the capital assets pricing model. Uh, so basically, the model try to uh, uh, show the trade-off between volatility, something you don't like, and also expected return, something you like, okay, and uh, try to show the trade-off between these two. Uh, but uh, this uh, model actually is not too applicable here. The reason is that, uh, well, uh, you are talking about uh, initiative, something that has not happened before. Okay, so you cannot, uh, like, uh, say, the uh, 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 capital asset pricing model to try to estimate what we call the, the beta coefficient to show the volatility of a particular stock as compared with the volatility of the market as a whole. Because uh, you are talking about a particular and very unique project. Okay, so in that case, uh, that model is not uh, too applicable here. And uh, as a result of that, we should, uh, I think we still should uh, rely on the expected return uh, approach, okay? Uh, but uh, here I want to uh, suggest that uh, maybe we can do something slightly better than uh, the traditional uh, expected return approach. And that is what we call, uh, that, that's what I call the uh, extended approach, extended expected return approach. Now, why is that? And uh, what is that? Okay, so basically, uh, if you go back to the uh, previous uh, equation, then we know that uh, the expected return depends on three parameters. One is the return uh, uh, when we have a good state, and the return when we have a bad state, and also the probability of the good state. 
Okay. So basically, we have three parameters, and uh, in applying the extended uh, 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 return approach, we assume that these three numbers are given, or at least we have confidence in the values of these parameters. Okay. And then we plug in uh, the values of these uh, num uh, these uh, uh, three parameters, and then try to see uh, whether the expected return is positive or negative. Okay, so that is the usual approach. Uh, but actually, we can do something more than that uh, in most cases. Okay, okay. Now, in that case, uh, what we would uh, uh, can, we, what we can argue is that maybe we can try to spend money on improving the expected return of a particular uh, project. Okay, so in this uh, equation. Uh, E is the expected return that we can derive from the early equation, and uh, except that uh, now in that equation we assume that uh, the values of some of the parameters can be altered, can be improved. Okay. C is the money that we spend on improving uh, the uh, expected return, and uh, therefore the project, uh, the profit, or uh, the return to the government is equal to the uh, new expected return minus the money we spent. Okay. Now in this case, the money we spend is something we uh, would be able to calculate, and uh, E is something that uh, we would uh, have to uh, do some uh, estimation and so on. Okay. No, okay, now in that case, uh, we'll try to uh, okay, see how we can improve uh, the situation. So basically, I, I, I want to argue that, uh, well, uh, we try to spend on money on Go back to the, 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 the equation. Now, so we try to improve E, but how can we improve E? Now, there are three ways. Since we have three parameters, so we have three ways of improving E. One is to improve the probability of good state, okay? So suppose that you're selling ice cream, and suppose that you have a way to affect the weather. You just try to get more sunny days. Now, if you can do that, uh, then you improve P, okay, and uh, also uh, you can improve G. That is uh, the return that you can get when you have a sunny day. Now, how can you do that? Well, try to uh, put up a big sign in front of your your, your 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 shop, your store, or whatever, saying that well, we have very nice, delicious ice cream, or something like that. Okay, so in order to attract more customers. Now, if you can uh, get more customers, then you can get more business, then your return during a good stay would be improved, okay? And uh, maybe uh, the third way is to reduce the value of G of uh, B, okay? Now, B is uh, the, uh, uh, the return, which is negative uh, in, uh, yeah, when you have a bad uh, day. Now, as long as you are able to make your loss during a bad day smaller, but well, then you're, you're improving E, okay? So that is uh, three ways of uh, doing that. Now, in terms of the initiative, in terms of the initiative, what can we do, okay? Okay, now, in, in, uh, cre in, uh, in, in increasing P, the probability of having good state, well, to do that, well, we can do, uh, the, the Chinese government in particular can uh, uh, get more information, uh, uh, then try to know more about the uh, chance of uh, getting the contract signed, the chance of uh, completing uh, the initiative, the project, and so on. So that is the way to improve P, okay? Another way is to improve G. That means, uh, well, you try to raise the, uh, the, the, the cost of the contract. So now uh, Thailand is negotiating with China uh, about the price of building a uh, high-speed uh, high, bit, high speed railway uh, between um, uh, Lao, Laos and also Bangkok, okay? And now the Thai government is saying that, well, um, yeah, you, it's too, too expensive, and now I uh, try to build only part of that, okay? Whatever, so basically, uh, if wa uh, China wants to be sure that, uh, well, it is not going to lose money, uh, then at least, uh, well, uh, to raise the price of contract of the project would be one way, okay. Another way is um, uh, B, uh, to reduce the B, okay. Now, here, uh, when China signed a contract, 
with the local government about uh, building a high-speed railway, uh, that does not mean that everything would uh, be fine even after you have signed the contract. Okay. Now here I give you two examples, okay, two uh, cases to illustrate the uh, risk of uh, that kind of uh, project. One is Mexico, okay. and uh, Mexico actually is uh, trying to build a, um, uh, a high-speed railway, uh, and uh, well, it uh, uh, invited uh, several countries to submit bids for this, that uh, high-speed railway. Okay, uh, the high-speed railway is not too long, uh, basically, uh, it, and and uh, and therefore, uh, uh, China submitted a bid. Uh, by the China Railway uh, Construction Corporation, okay, and uh, then uh, the China won the, the bid, okay, so that seems to be good news, uh, but unfortunately, that is not the end of the story, because uh, about a month later, uh, the Mexico, the Mexican government say, said that, uh, well, uh, now I'm going to postpone it, uh, at least, uh, well, there some, seems to be some problem, and then, well, try to submit another bid, okay. Now, you have already spent so much money on uh, studying the project, and now you submit the project and you won the contract, and, uh, but eventually that seems to be uh, a bubble. Okay. Uh, and therefore, uh, the, uh, China submitted the second uh, bid, okay, and then the, it won the second bid again. Okay. So that, that is good news. Uh, but then, uh, about um, uh, several weeks, okay, two weeks, I think, uh, the Mexican government said that, okay, I'm going to postpone this project indefinitely, okay? And uh, the, government, uh, the Mexican government seems to be uh, feeling bad about that. And, uh, okay, so uh, the, the, the government tried to calm down uh, the Chin Chinese uh, uh, co company and then uh, pay uh, a compensation, okay, a penalty, okay? So usually uh, if you... Uh, breach the contract, then you have to pay penalty. But what is the penalty? Okay, the penalty is only what uh, 1.3 million US dollar. That is a small sum of money. Okay, uh, ideally have that amount of money. Okay, uh, but uh, for a government, this is a very small amount of money, and also this is small as compared with uh, what the China company has spent on studying the project and uh, writing up the proposal and so on. Okay. So in that case, uh, this project means a loss for China. Okay. Now, if uh, you are going to do this again, probably you would write down in the contract clear, more clearly about uh, what kind of penalty that uh, the local government would have to pay. Okay. Something like that. Now, this is case one. Case two, uh, Sri Lanka. Okay. So I mentioned about uh, this uh, uh, earlier. Uh, so Sri Lanka, okay, um, in uh, the previous government, uh, uh, signed a contract with China uh, to uh, build a Colombo port city project. Okay, now Colombo is the capital of Sri Lanka. So basically, um, just uh, outside the city limit, uh, basically China is going to uh, renovate uh, an existing project and make it bigger, make it more modern, and also uh, uh, try to uh, get some new land from the project, okay? And according to the contract, that new piece of land, or at least part of that piece, new piece of land will belong to China indefinitely, okay? So that becomes part of China's land, okay? And then uh, in uh, uh, the, uh, July last year, uh, they had a new government. And the new government said that, well, that is not possible and whatever, okay? So in that case, uh, the uh, new government asked the Chinese government to stop the project. Okay, the project has already started, uh, so they they are building the uh, the, the the port already. Uh, but now they, they have to. Uh, China has stopped that project. Okay, and uh, that was the, the uh, uh, January, two thousand fifteen. Okay, and then uh, this year, okay, uh, maybe after one year's time, uh, th this new government and uh, they discovered that, uh, well, uh, having this kind of project is good for the, eco f good for the economy and the country, and uh, therefore, uh, the new government asked China to continue the project. 
Okay. Uh, but uh, because the project has been stopped uh, for a certain period of time, and the company is losing money because uh, you have already uh, uh, ship uh, machines, uh, hire workers, and so on to build the project. But now you are not able to do that. Okay, so uh, the China Chinese co co company is losing money. And uh, uh, just a few uh, two year, two two weeks ago, the uh, Prime Minister of uh, Sri Lanka came to uh, China and tried to ask uh, the forgiveness of uh, uh, from China and also try to attract. Uh, 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 investment uh, from China to uh, Sri Lanka and also mentioned that, uh, well, that uh, port pro uh, city uh, uh, project should be continued and they have confidence that, uh, well, Colombo would become uh, uh, another Sanjan. Okay. Okay. And, uh, but there's uh, one problem here. The company, okay, I think it's the China Railway Construction Company, Corporation uh, is ha, has lost money because of the stalling of the project. Okay, and actually the uh, that company is asking for something like uh, say 1.5 1.5 billion U.S. dollar. Okay, uh, but uh, the Sri Lankan uh, Prime Minister didn't mention anything about this uh, compensation. Okay, now if uh, eventually. Uh, Sri Lanka is not going to give any compensation. That means that the Chinese car company is losing money. Okay, so that means that well, you can see that so you can see the riskness of uh, of this kind of investment. Okay, and the uh, loss can be quite substantial. Okay, okay. Now this um, is the, uh, well. This is all I want to say. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Well, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Okay. Um, I'll try my best. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Wong. You have provided a very interesting research project. And I have read some slide that you have given is the multiply effect. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, actually, I think it's a plan that given by China to attract different country to enroll in the project, right? Yeah. And to set up some uh, well beings after you eat, take part in the project, you will have benefits. And the multiply effect, you mentioned there's a lot of things that will provide multiple effect. Like you have mentioned technology, uh, neighbor and capitals, the inflows, okay. And I believe that if we focus on the multiply effect, different country may have different, uh, uh, have emphasis on different kinds of capitals or different kinds of uh, uh, the laborers or something, technology. Different country have different requirements or different uh, uh, needs to input. So if we focus on this part, I, I'm interested whether you have done research on the multiply effect, so that on or on the cost size, on the cost of investment, we can have a minimum uh, optimi optimizations of the cost, so that on the cost side you have minimum uh, uh, research, so that we can minimize the cost, so that we can uh, satisfy the requirements and attract the countries that go into the projects. And so on the other hand, you, 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 you focus on the, return, uh, the returns. The return side, you have mentioned uh, the good days and bad days, and you provide some uh, suggestions. And is it possible to, to develop further, to detail, so that how the good days come from, how, how the good earning of the good days, so that they can have any calculations to extend this research and so that we can have the maximize and on, 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 the, on the left hand side. So I think the project will be more complete and more interesting. I'm not sure whether, whether, whether our understanding is correct or not. So I just ask, I just provide some uh, questions. And uh, so that's questions. Thank you. Should I answer now or what? 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for your comments. Uh, actually, the, the multiplier effect is the ordinary uh, multi multiplier effect in macroeconomics. So basically, uh, you can uh, uh, something like I say the ma the government spends one dollar, and uh, you have a multiplier of uh, five, for example. Then altogether, you get five uh, dollars uh, additional in the economy. So this is the ordinary uh, multiplier effect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Right. Now, the multiplier may be different in different countries. Okay. That depends on the saving rate. Okay. And also, uh, if you look at, uh, say, additional effects on the local economy, other than the uh, high-speed railway, actually, we have to look at different countries individually. Because uh, gov uh, the, US, uh, the, the Chinese government is signing uh, individual contracts with different countries. And the contracts in general are not the same. Okay, now I can gi give you an example. Uh, one contract would uh, state that, uh, well, when uh, China is going to provide the technology and the fund and so on to build uh, the high-speed uh, railway, and uh, they actually mention the stops okay, in different cities okay, uh, inside the economies. Uh, and also the contract specifies uh, what China can do uh, in addition to the uh, station. Okay. One contract would mention that China has the right of developing the land uh, along both sides of the, uh, of the uh, train line, uh, especially uh, close to the station. That means uh, well, China is trying to uh, uh, get some uh, benefit, additional benefit from the project. Okay. Now that is something uh, uh, th this paper cannot uh, analyze too much because uh, it varies from one country to another. And also uh, the story is still being uh, unfolded uh, gradually. Okay? So we are not at the end of the, of, of the project. We are not at the end of, this, uh, 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 of the initiative. So there are so many things that uh, I do not know, and also so many things that no one knows, actually, because uh, this is still un, uh, up to the negotiation between the Chinese government and also some of these governments. Okay. But uh, I think uh, it's a good um, uh, research topic because uh, there are so many things that we do not know, but there are so many things that are so interesting and important, and therefore it is uh, actually uh, uh, interesting to uh, do some estimation. But uh, that is beyond what this paper can do. Thank you, Professor Wong. Is there um, the lady at the back? Um, so thank you for giving this talk, uh, which is pretty comprehensive. And um, I just want to know, um, just now you mentioned that uh, there may be some opportunities like the high, uh, high speed wheel rail, uh, trade or setting up business, etc. So uh, I want to know, uh, in your opinion, um, in what ways do you think that the small companies in Hong Kong, especially the small ones, uh, can benefit from this uh, one belt one row initiative? Okay, actually, one point I mentioned, uh, emphasized in the paper is that you have to, to do some investigation uh, because um, you have to know what kind of goods and services would be needed uh, for the initiative and, uh, and so on. And also, you know uh, quite well about your, uh, what the, your company can offer, but uh, you have to try to see whether what you can offer and what the local economies would need can match, okay. and uh, this is something that uh, uh, you have to uh, uh, explore. And uh, if I were um, uh, a manager of uh, some uh, large uh, companies in Hong Kong, uh, other than providing the uh, financial services uh, to um, these countries, uh, something that uh, people have been emphasizing, but I think that we, we can do something more than that. Uh, so if for our large company in Hong Kong, I would uh, suggest that the first thing they would have to do is to uh, uh, know more about these countries. Okay. And uh, uh, maybe one thing they can do is to set up a local branch over there. 
uh, maybe a small office, it does not have to be very big because uh, now you don't know what uh, you can do, uh, but maybe a small office over there uh, to have a better understanding of the economies, okay? Uh, and then whenever opportunities arise, you may be the first one to know, okay? And uh, probably you would be the first one to get the benefits, okay? Now, one, I'll give you an, exa an example. Suppose that uh, in order to build uh, the high-speed uh, uh, railway, uh, the China uh, Railway Construction Corporation would need more screws, for example, uh, in order to uh, well, tighten uh, the, uh, the bridge or whatever. And if you have uh, an office there, maybe you would be the first one to know uh, such a need, and then maybe you would be the, the first one to arrange for these screws. Okay? So something you have to be there in order to know more uh, about uh, what uh, you would be needed. And also I mentioned earlier that uh, uh, China actually, in signing some of the contracts, uh, China mentioned that, uh, well, it has the right of developing the land along uh, the, the high-speed uh, high railway line. Okay. Now, if that is the case, then you know that, uh, well, probably China is going to build uh, houses and so on. Then you know that, well, th that station is going to attract a lot of local residents. Okay. Uh, basically, uh, business would grow substantially uh, and, uh, uh, in that area. Then maybe you would be the first one to do that. Okay. Build, build uh, offices, buildings, uh, apartments, and so on. Okay. So that is, well, I, I'm not too experienced in doing business, so uh, that is the only thing I can think of. But um, uh, the principle is that you have to be there. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, as time is running short, we can have one more question. So first, thank you for giving an, an inspiring talk. And I'm curious about, uh, the, do you think the management risk in is high in Hong Kong under this new initiative? Well, high is a relative term, so I don't know uh, what that means. But uh, actually, uh, you can do an assessment of the risk the retur uh, possible returns and so on before you decide whether uh, you want to invest there. Now, there are some types of business that would uh, have lower, much lower risks. For example, trading. Okay? Now, in uh, one of the uh, diagrams, I show that, uh, well, in the third stage, you have trading. Now, suppose that you um, have uh, trading of these uh, economies, uh, then uh, the risk would be smaller. Investment would be would have uh, much higher risks. Okay, so I think that that's up to the uh, companies to decide whether the risk is high or low or not that high. Uh, but uh, before you know that, you have to get more information. Uh, the problem is that uh, well, right now, no one. It seems that no one, even uh, the gov uh, Chinese government, uh, does not have a very clear and good picture of the initiative. Okay. Now, one uh, reason I, uh, uh, I, I, I can mention uh, is that, uh, well, uh, yesterday I, I had a chance to uh, meet with uh, some uh, business in, in, in China. And uh, actually, according to him, he said that, uh, well, uh, that the Chinese government is not giving out too much information about what the initiative is. Okay. Well, that, in some, se um, in some sense, uh, probably, uh, that is too, not too good for uh, the companies when they are thinking of uh, investing in, uh, in uh, some of these countries. But one thing we can understand is that, uh, well, the initiative is still new. New in the sense that, uh, well, it's not too much uh, time after it was first proposed. And also it is new because nothing like that has happened in the past or in some other countries. No one knows exactly what they can expect. And something has to be developed. Okay. And, uh, but uh, as I said, if uh, 
uh, companies uh, are uh, thinking of, uh, well, uh, taking advantage of the opportunities, what they should do is to try to get more information about this in order to be the first one to invest uh, there. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you very much, Professor Wang. Please be seated. Please give a big applause to Professor Wang. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for joining today, and this is the end of the public lecture. I hope you found today's lecture informative and useful. So I would like to request for your assistant to complete the evaluation form in your folder. We would love to hear any feedback or suggestions that you may have for us. Thank you very much.